Gormi from uh, Microsoft Research in Redmond. He got his PhD from the University of Maryland, but was actually supervised by uh, Mike Hicks. I think that's the first that we have uh, uh, a PhD student and his former supervisor uh, here in the workshop. Um, Nick joined Microsoft uh, roughly 10 years ago. He's now a senior researcher there. And he's probably best known for his work on uh, F-Star, which is a, a quite influential and innovative uh, deductive verification system, which has many applications inside Microsoft and outside. So for instance, it's used as one of the main verifiers in, uh, in the Everest project, which we'll hear about uh, during this workshop. So it's great to have Nick here. Welcome, and please go ahead. Thanks, Peter. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about um, uh, Project Everest and Meta F-Star in particular, um, a an extension to FSTAR in support of uh, meta programming that enables us to get proofs to go uh, uh, scale better and uh, uh, tackle domains where SMT solvers don't work so well. Uh, this is joint work with lots of people in um, uh, many labs, uh, like the three MSR labs, uh, and also at INRIA, CMU, Edinburgh, plenty of interns, lots of visitors. If you're interested in this stuff, uh, this list it can grow even longer. So, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, that's us. We gathered recently a subset of us in, in, uh, in, in at, MSR, uh, at MSR Cambridge. That's Project Everest. So, uh, Project Everest. What's it about? So, so we're all um, looking at look at TLS, Transport Layer Security. You may know it as SSL or as the protocol that powers HTTPS. When you go to your bank, um, your uh, connection is encrypted using TLS, and TLS is by now, the, the most widely deployed security protocol out there. It's securing, um, that number keeps increasing, maybe half of all internet traffic, and it's, it's going to increase even more. Uh, and it's not just HTTP, it's also securing, um, uh, say, voice over IP and uh, other things. Now, uh, TLS, what it's designed to do is, uh, it's meant to build a secure channel between uh, two endpoints, a client and a server, and a secure channel is meant to give you both authenticity and confidentiality, meaning that if a, if a server receives a message, even in the presence of a network adversary, the server can conclude that the message came from the client, that's authenticity. And um, uh, confidentiality means it's that the adversary cannot distinguish between a, um, uh, a, a communication between the client and the server and uh, a, a, a random stream of bytes, except for negligible files. So um, that's its goal, but TLS has been hit by uh, a wide variety of, of uh, flaws, attacks over the years, over the last 20 years. Uh, some of these are very low-level attacks on implementations like buffer overruns, but others are deeper uh, protocol design flaws or crypto flaws. Uh, and uh, there's actually a, a RFC on attacks on TLS, which uh, uh, categorizes a, a whole uh, slew of attacks. So, uh, what we're looking at is, um, uh, well, so before, before I go to that, so, so TLS 1.3 is a new RFC that just got uh, ratified in August. It's a new design of the protocol around modern crypto, around a, a simplified <coughs> core uh, crypto primitives and, and, and handshake. Uh, and so there's some hope that a, the new implementation of TLS will not suffer, suffer from these flaws. And it's also an opportunity. This means that there's new implementations required for everybody that will have to be rolled out. And that's a chance for us to get in there with a, a, a verified implementation that's going to rule out a whole class of flaws just by construction. So that's what we're up to. Uh, Project Everest is looking at building a verified implementation of uh, the secure communication stack uh, around TLS. That includes TLS, but also related uh, cryptographic algorithms, other protocols in the space. There's a, there's a new protocol coming up called Quick, um, and we're looking at building a verified implementation of this stack using uh, two tools: FSTAR, a verification tool that's, um, that I'm going to tell you about, and Z3, an SMT solver, which I'm sure many of you have heard about before. Um, we're doing all of this open source, uh, so um, especially because it's a security project, we strongly believe that. Uh, you can only gain credible security with public scrutiny, so all of this is open source. Um, roughly the way it works is that um, in XTAR, uh, you write 
a, a program and you decorate it with a specification, that's a mathematical specification of what the program's intended behavior is. So here, for instance, uh, is a uh, poly1305 is a MAC algorithm used in TLS. And uh, here's a spec for a, a, a low-level implementation of poly1305 that says, you don't have to read the details too much, but what it's saying is roughly that th this is a stateful function that's computing a MAC in uh, a specification of this MAC, where the specification is saying that this is a, some polynomial in uh, the finite field that poly1305 uses. Uh, given the spec and an implementation of the spec in F star, we can compile that spec, uh, th that implementation to a, a implementation in C that is idiomatic C where there are no additional dynamic checks. This, the code has been statically proven to implement this, uh, to satisfy the spec. So you get efficiency code with no runtime. <coughs> That's our general methodology. We, this is uh, at the scale of uh, just one crypto primitive, but we in general apply this methodology across the entire stack. And our goal is eventually to produce an implementation of the entire stack, where um, the, which roughly has this, this structure. You have at the very top a security specification of what it means for TLS to provide you with a secure channel. Um, there's a, uh, a large uh, implementation of, of TLS, protocol specs, and, and proofs. And at the bottom, there are uh, crypto hypotheses, for instance, that AES is a pseudo random function. So, as long as you trust our, implement, our, our assumptions and our spec at the top, you don't have to trust this large piece of verified code in the middle. Um, so, what do we verify? It, 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 uh, we verify everything that's in service of this top level spec. Whatever you need to do to prove that spec, you, you're forced to verify it of your code. So, as a baseline, you're forced to prove safety, memory and type safety. Without it, the top level theorem would not hold. Um, in order to, at various points in the stack, there are different requirements that come up. So functional correctness is also very typically necessary to prove at every level. Um, and we also prove, uh, of the lowest level crypto primitives, we prove uh, secrecy. So we prove, uh, for instance, um, uh, secrecy in the presence of certain class of side channel attacks. Modern crypto is required to be constant time, so, so we prove that uh, of our lowest level implementations. And then we also prove cri cryptographic security, meaning that this property of being a secure channel is it's a secure channel um, except with a negligible probability with respect to a polyno probability polynomial time adversary. So uh, we, uh, we have to prove that as well. So there's a, a cryptographic security argument at the top level. Despite all this, I mean, if, just, to, just to make clear, uh, verification of this form is, it, it, you shouldn't go away with the impression that Everest is going to be perfectly secure. There's, there are always trust assumptions. Uh, you have to trust our spec. You have to trust our tools. You have to trust our models. So um, that's, what, but that's, that's the name of the game with, with program verification. There's specific trust assumptions that you make based on which you can conclude these properties. Um, a big focus of Everest is not only to produce verified code, but to actually have that code uh, in a form that's deployable in the existing software ecosystem. So um, in the two, two and a half years or so that we've been working on Everest, we're at a point where we have a verified crypto code deployed in, um, in uh, the latest um, Windows developer previews for uh, the TLS components in, in, a, in, a, in a Windows implementation of this protocol called Quick. Mozilla, since we're all open source, uh, we are, uh, the deployed code is not restricted only to Microsoft products. Our, um, Mozilla NSS runs our verified crypto for uh, some elliptic curve algorithms. And recently, through the WireGuard secure VPN, the Linux kernel has Everest verified crypto in it as well. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus more on the programming languages tools that we use to build this, uh, this secure stack. So what's this f star thing anyway, right? So uh, it's a programming language, it's a proof assistant, it's a program verification tool. And you're thinking, well, there's plenty of those things around already, why do we need another one? Um, well, I think there's kind of uh, two camps in program verification tools. On, on the one hand, you have interactive proof assistants like Cock and Isabel and Agda and so on that are based on very expressive dependently typed theories. 
uh, where you can essentially state and prove uh, things that are arbitrary properties in mathematics, but they're based on purely functional programming languages. So in a way, they're very expressive logics, but impoverished programming models, because it's pure functions only. And uh, all proofs are, tend to be interactive. On the other side, you have uh, verification tools backed by SMT solvers to give, give you automation that are based on richer programming languages, so they have effects and sometimes concurrency and so on, uh, but their specification languages tend to be uh, somewhat more impoverished as compared to, say, Kotlin. You typically work in first order logic extended in some theories. In the middle is this gap that F star is trying to fill. We, um, F star is a functional programming language with effects, so it's like OCaml or F sharp. It compiles to OCaml and F sharp, actually, and it's a subset of it compiles also to C. It's got a core logic that's uh, based on dependent type theory, so it's as expressive as um, Kotka or Agda or Beam. Uh, but it's got SMT-based automation as a, as a first-class concern. So uh, uh, the F star provides an encoding to SMT. We use Z3 as our SMT solver usually. So it gives you a, a verification experience that's trying to approach something like Daphne or Liquid Haskell or VCC. And uh, within F star is, and that's, uh, that's this meta F star thing that I'll tell you about, is a way to extend the language with um, uh, ad hoc um, uh, domain-specific proof automation techniques and meta programs. So you can think of this as, it's got a tactic language as well. So to give you a taste of what F-star looks like, <laughs> at, you know, at, at a very simple level, you write in a syntax that looks like OCaml. Um, you can write a specification for your programs that's richer than the types that you can give to OCaml programs. So, Here's an implementation of, of uh, factorial. This has a clicker on it. Maybe not at this point. Um, and uh, you, can give, you can give factorial a specification that says factorial takes non-negative numbers. It's a total function that returns uh, positive numbers. Uh, and you can present the factorial <coughs> program and its specification to s <coughs> It will generate a verification condition and, and feed that verification condition to Z3. Roughly what this looks like is that it, uh, at the core of F star, F star's typing judgment, the way you can see it is that uh, in, a, in a particular context, the factorial program has a particular type T subject to a verification condition phi, which, and that verification condition gets passed to Z3. And if it checks, if Z3 is able to prove that, that verification condition, the meta theory of F star says that factorial indeed has that type. So um, that's factorial is a pure program, uh, but F, F star, one of its main features is that it allows uh, the core language to be extended with effects. And the basic idea is, is probably familiar to you from Haskell or um, uh, other functional programming languages. At the core, you get to define, you get to encode effects in F star using monad. So uh, here's um, a, the state monad, as you'd expect. ST of A is a function from states to results cross states. But the interesting thing is that given such a, uh, a monadic signature, F star can derive for that monadic signature a weakest precondition calculus suitable for use with that monad. So for instance, if you're working with, with state, um, F star will derive a weakest, pre a weakest precondition semantics for state monads that you can see it as a, um, a predicate transformer of this signature, meaning that it takes stateful post-conditions on results A to stateful preconditions, where stateful post-conditions are uh, predicates on results in final states, and stateful preconditions are preconditions on the initial state. So if you write a, a, a stateful program in F star, you can give it a spec with respect to its predicate transformer semantics and ask F star to prove something Uh, and F, having derived this weakest precondition semantics, F star provides a way where you can package up this weakest precondition semantics into what we think of as an effect. So then you can just write idiomatic, effectful ML code and, and prove properties about it. So here's, for instance, a, an, an ML program that's using state and exceptions. 
It's um, <coughs> you're referencing a, a reference, checking if it's zero, and if it's not, it's inverting it and updating the reference. And you can write a program like this, and you can give it a spec in a star that says um, invert is a, is a function that takes a reference. It has um, a reference to an integer. It, it may have effects of state and exception. Uh, and uh, a, a post condition that says, if the function doesn't raise an exception, uh, then the input reference is not zero and the final contents of the reference are the inverse of the inverse of the reference. Or you can give it another spec and say, if the client can prove that the initial value of the reference is not zero, then this function never raises an exception. So, uh, and, and in fact, inverts the, the argument. So you can write these kinds of specs about your effective programs. And, uh, by default, F star will check it using Z3. So we, we kind of take this basic idea, and uh, because we're, we're based on, a, a, uh, on full dependent type theory, you can encode within F star a programming model, essentially, of your choice. So we uh, embed inside F star a C-like programming model, where, where it's a state monad, but the state is a representation of a concert C-like memory model, where uh, uh, we have separate regions for heaps and stacks, and a region you can think of it as a, a map, a partial map from addresses to values of any type. So this is a heterogeneous map from addresses to values. And here, it may, just to emphasize, this, it, being able to express this is essentially relying on a lot of dependent type theory. It's using higher universes, it's using sigma types, it's using, um, uh, yeah. So in order to express that, we need dependent type theory. Uh, and based on this, on this model, you can, uh, you, we, we enrich it enough to be able to express mutable arrays, pointers, structs, unions, all with uh, manual memory management with explicit allocations and frees and uh, stack allocation, and, and so on. So uh, to give you a sense of what that looks like, here is an implementation in F star and a spec of uh, the ChaCha20 stream cipher. Uh, and if you compile it to C, you get something that's roughly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the F star code that you wrote. Uh, that's got uh, stack allocation, pointer arithmetic. Uh, and the spec that you wrote in F star, it vanishes as you, as you get C code. And as you carry this further, for instance, this is a, a, a streaming encryption in F star where you write a spec that looks like uh, four type theory or COP, so dependently typed uh, specifications. And here's its implementation. And the implementation, I argue, looks kind of like what you would expect in a tool like Daphne, where you write imperative code, you decorate it with lemmas at specific points, and that's enough for the SMT solver to see that this implementation satisfies that spec. <coughs> So when this works well, it's great, but SMT solvers, um, you hit a limit with them. There's only, uh, they only handle some theories well. And at, at a certain point, you, you, you hit a scalability wall. Uh, so for instance, here's a proof of a, of a lemma um, that's involving some nonlinear arithmetic. And the, the specifics of the lemma don't matter too much, but uh, there are some parts of this, this proof that are decorated with programmers writing arc. Do I really have to write this myself? And it, the programmer is, is here is, is writing a lemma to show that um, that addition is distributive, uh, which is at an extremely low level. I mean, you would hope that you wouldn't have to write this uh, this kind of stuff yourself. But when you're working with nonlinear arithmetic, uh, SMT solvers need a lot of handholding. Uh, here's another example. So uh, this is uh, an implementation of the TLS standard for uh, parsing and formatting cipher suites. And on the left, we have a formatter for it, and on the right, we have a parser for it. That's handwritten code. It's, it's a lot of code, it's a lot of boilerplate. And in, this is F star, so when you write this, uh, and you're trying to do a proof about TLS, in addition to all this boilerplate code, you have to write proof that says that these two functions, for instance, are mutual inverses. So that's even more uh, handwritten. So these proofs can sometimes be at a very low level of abstraction as well. So what we're aiming for um, with meta F star is we want a way in which programmers can define DSLs best suited to their task, 
to the extent that they can also define ways in, uh, custom ways in which GSL programs are type-tracked, the way those, their verification conditions are produced and discharged. Um, rather than writing programs by hand, we'd like them to be able to meta-program their programs so that they don't have to write all this boilerplate the themselves. And maybe even to the extent of they should be able to define their own equivalence-preserving transformations on F-star code in F-star, so that they can just work at a much higher level of abstraction. Now, the way in which we, we, we do this is really by treating the F-star object language as its own meta-language. Okay, and this is an idea that we're building on that I think first um, was uh, in a paper by David Christensen and Edwin Brady for Idris. Um, uh, Leo de Mora has uh, implemented something similar for Lean, and we're building on this idea and trying to implement something similar for F-star. And I think it's a really cool idea. So, uh, in a nutshell, here's, here's how I see the idea. Uh, compilers have uh, pipelines, and here's a, a, a typical passive compiler pipeline for, for say, a tool like F-star, where you write a source program, it's parsed and desugared, it's type-checked, and then you get some code generation in the back. And in the case of F-star, and as in many uh, dependent type systems, the type tracker itself has several components. There's higher order unification, there's a normalizer. Dependent type theory is a lot about computation, so the type tracker includes a computation engine in it. And in the case of F-star, there's also an SMT encoding that can encode F-star's SMT, F-star's logic to, to SMT. Now, the idea, of elaborated reflection is that you turn this passive compiler pipeline into something that's scriptable by an F-star program. So you write a meta program that is interpreted by this normalizer that customizes how these components work together. Rather than having just a fixed orchestration on the components, the meta program scripts them. And this meta program itself interacts with each of these components through APIs that these, compon these components expose to F-star programs themselves. Okay, so the F-star compiler is scripted by an F-star program. Okay. Um, feel free to interrupt with questions. That, yeah. How do you make sure it still sounds? It doesn't break everything. Okay, so, yeah, so how do you do this and make sure that it doesn't break everything? And I'm in, um, in a few easy steps that I'm going to explain to you in a minute. Um, so essentially what happens is that you need to provide an API to compiler internals uh, to F-star programs so that they can reflect and construct the syntax of terms, the type checking environment, typing derivations, extraction. They should be able to reflect and construct on every internal compiler data structure, but do so in a safe way. Okay? Uh, and the, the way that we do this in F-star is by is in um, what I think of as three, three steps. Okay? The first is you see metaprogramming as a computational effect of proof state transformers. So a metaprogram has a proof, starts with a proof state, does some stuff to it, produces a final proof state. And you, you compose metaprograms this way. Okay? Um, primitive operations that manipulate proof states have to be constructed in terms of trusted compiler primitives, whose soundness can be argued in terms of existing uh, uh, trust assumptions on compiler primitives. And you need a way to reflect on syntax. So you need some way to quote and unquote syntax. So, so the first, let me take this uh, step by step. So, so what is a proof state? A proof state is um, defined in terms of typed holes. So a hole is a, um, a, a missing program fragment in a typed context. So there's, here's uh, one hole is in a context gamma. There's a hole. Holes are, you can think of holes as meta variables. There's some, something that the unifier has to solve, for instance, at a type tau. And that's a single hole or sometimes a goal. And a proof state is a collection of pending holes and uh, plus some internal state that, that the meta program doesn't see. So there's some internal bookkeeping that the compiler has to do. For instance, the persistent state of the union line structure inside the compiler. So that's beneath the level of abstraction that the, 
that, that an error program needs to see. So, uh, since F star is extensible with effects, what we can do is to say, okay, I'm going to define a new effect in F star of meta programs. And a meta program is a, um, a program that um, is a combination of state, where the state is a proof state, exceptions, because the program can either return successfully with a result in a final, final proof state or an error, and non termination. That's the DV there. Programs can, uh, meta programs don't need to terminate. We shouldn't be forced to prove them terminating. Um, and uh, once you do that, given F star's existing machinery for effect and extensibility, you can say to F star, take that, that, that definition of monad, build me a WP calculus for it, and uh, let's extend F star with a new effect for meta programs. And using the effect system, you can isolate meta programs from normal programs, ensuring that meta programs don't break the soundness of normal programs. Now, uh, one thing to point to, so that's how we turn it into an effect. Now, meta programs have two actions that I've shown you here, among others, but, uh, and the actions are to get the current state and uh, say to raise an exception. But notice that I Despite this being a state monad, I've conspicuously omitted the put action. Put lets you just change the proof state with some other proof state. And the proof state is a trusted internal compiler data structure that represents your, your partially completed proof. You shouldn't be able to just blow it away and replace it with another proof. Okay? So the only things you can do to the proof state are interact with it through a few trusted primitives that the compiler provides you. Where each such primitive is, um, can be read as a typing rule read back. Okay, so take here, this is the typing rule for, for typing abstractions. That should be a, a familiar rule. Um, now, if you want to turn this into a, a, a meta program primitive, there's a primitive called intro to introduce um, a binder into a context. The way you can see that is by reading the abstraction rule backwards. Um, it's, a pro it's a meta program with that signature. And um, the way it works is that if you, Abstractly, if you see the way I see it, is that if you apply intro to a proof state whose head goal is an arrow, you can transform it successfully into a proof state whose head goal is the body of the function with the, with the, with the binary context. And internally, you generate a fresh name and you set the previous meta variable to the partially completed lambda. And if you try to apply intro to any other proof state where the head is, for instance, not an arrow, intro fails. And you can handle the failure. You can catch the failure and try some other tactic if you like. Um, now, reflecting on syntax, the core syntax of F star is a, is a data type that looks like that with maybe 12 different forms, 15 different forms. Um, and this syntax is now available to F star programs to inspect as a data type. And you can quote a piece of syntax. This is, you can think of this as a callback into F star's desugaring. You wrote a piece of concrete syntax, and the quote tells F star, parse it, desugar it, give me back something in that data type. And you can unquote things. You can say, given a piece of syntax, call back into the type tracker and check that it has a particular type. And um, that's what unquote looks like. So here's, here's you know, a small example putting the pieces together. Let's say I have an identity function. A, 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 let, me, let me be more precise. I have a variable identity, ID at that particular type, and I want to metaprogram it. The way I can metaprogram it is by saying, I'm not going to write the identity function right here. I'm just going to write a hole, underscore, and I'm going to solve this hole by writing a tactic or metaprogram. And at this point, the goal is I need to provide a hole at the type of ID. And I can do this by First, doing an intro, getting a binder for the name of the type. Doing another intro, getting a name for the formal parameter. And saying, solve the last goal with hypothesis. And that, these three commands builds an identity function, a polymorphic identity function. Okay. Now, remember this, this monstrosity of lots of boilerplate and proof. Instead of writing a, a, um, a parser and its formatter and its proof by hand, you can instead write I define a type. Here's, for instance, a, a palette of, uh, of colors with intensities. 
And instead of writing a, a parser and form, format it by hand, I can write a meta program that's given this type of that. It's going to generate a parser and a serializer at a particular type. And that type, this, it's a dependent pair of a, of a parser, of a palette, and a serializer indexed by that parser. And um, you can see a parser as at a type T as a function from bytes to an option of T. Parsers are partial because not all bytes may be a valid representation of a T. And a serializer is indexed by a parser. The type is implicit. And what it says is that the type of a serializer captures its correctness property with respect to the parser. What it says is that a serializer is a function from um, T's to bytes such that uh, the parsing of a serialization succeeds with the same value and the other direction too, that if the parser succeeds, then the serializer succeeds and produces the same value. So the, the, the correctness, uh, so instead of writing this boilerplate, you just generate a correct by construction, you meta program a correct by construction parser and serializer. Uh, there are other ways in which you can interpose meta programs on the, on, uh, the type checking of an SR program. So, for instance, here's an assertion. And assertions can also now be decorated with metaprograms. Rather than saying assert, it used to say assert on its own, this property would be fed to a SMT solver. But now you can say assert this property by a particular tactic. And this tactic is now faced with solving a goal that includes all the variables in scope and all control flow assumptions up to that point. So the goal that this tactic sees is something of the form in a context with x being an at and hypothesis from this if that x is greater than one, prove for me that x squared is greater than x. And now we see SMT as just another tactic. So you can, and it's not that we, we, we're saying that if you, you know, SMT and tactics can profitably coexist. You don't want to do your proof only by SMT or only by tactics. You want to be able to pre-process your, your, your goal as much as you need by a meta program and then feed end goals as we see SMT as an end game tactic, once you're left with a, with, a, with a proof obligation that you think an SMT solver can handle well, feed it to SMT. And this is a callback into F star's existing SMT encoding. So remember this, this is this proof of an arithmetic property where the programmer is doing a lot of these very tedious uh, bits themselves. Um, instead of doing this, um, here's, a, here's a program that is actually doing a proof of one of the key lemmas in poly 105. It's proving that uh, multiplication in this field is equivalent to some, uh, to, to some other term. H times R is equal to HH in this field. And where previously doing this lemma required, it turned out 41 steps of explicit rewriting by the programmer. It's a very determined uh, programmer to do all these rewritings themselves. I think Chris is that programmer uh, at some point. Uh, uh, but Chris wrote a, 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 a tactic um, called, uh, which is a reflective, uh, it's a proof by reflection, it's a meta program that's, that's in any uh, commutative semi-ring, it's normalizing terms in that semi-ring. So given that, so we derive an instance of this uh, commutative semi-ring for integers with, uh, with multiplication in addition, and in, in order to prove this property, we first, pre-process the, the goal using this rewriting, producing a goal that can then be solved by SMT using linear arithmetic only. So we don't have to write, for instance, an omega tactic in F star, because SMT is really good at, at linear arithmetic. We only need to do that part of the proof that the SMT solver doesn't hand, handle very well, which is rewriting nonlinear terms. Uh, a final bit, so, uh, like I said, these meta programs are, uh, they script the components in the FSTAR type checker by running them on the FSTAR normalizer. Well, FSTAR programs can be extracted to OCaml, and all FSTAR pro and the FSTAR compiler itself is an FSTAR program that can be compiled to OCaml. Well, meta programs can also be extracted to OCaml. So you write a meta program, here's the FSTAR compiler, you wrote your tactic, you compile it to a dynamically loadable library in, in uh, OCaml, and then load it into the FSTAR compiler, and now your tactic has, is truly an, an a extension to the FSTAR compiler, and runs at native speed. So what this means is that 
many core language features that you would expect to be implemented primitively in a language like type classes. Type classes in FSTAR are not implemented inside the FSTAR compiler. They're implemented as a tactic by a user outside of FSTAR who can customize how type class resolution works as they like. Um, it doesn't change the trust hypotheses in the compiler. There's nothing trusted about type class resolution. And it runs at native speed. So as a language implementer, I love this. Essentially, every time I get a for, for feature request like this, you know, the user can implement it themselves. Um, so um, uh, that's mostly what I have. So some, some takeaways. Um, there, there's, uh, there's a few principles that I think are, are really important for STAR and, and, in, uh, and its use in Everest. So I think freedom of expression is a really important one. Tools for large-scale, full program verification, they need to have arbitrary expressive power. And that arbitrary expressive power, the way you get, one way in which you can get it is by just using dependent type theory. Because at that point, you can state whatever you like. Now, if you're in such an expressive logic, um, uh, there are some trade-offs. You want proof automation. You want expressiveness, like I've already said. And you also want control. And in some cases, you actually prefer control over automation. Unpredictability of a, a prover is, is, is disastrous. So SMT is great, and we, we strongly use SMT to get automation, but it's not a panacea. SMT, you're eventually going to hit a complexity or undesirability wall with, with SMT solvers, and you need a way out when you hit this wall. And the way you do that, I think, is by using a careful combination of tactics and SMT. And whereas I think in, uh, some people have, have this impression that through the use of tactics, you're kind of giving up on, on automation and you're maybe just going to interactive proof. But the way I see it is that tactics plus SMT can actually improve automation when compared to tactics alone or SMT alone. And meta star is a way of self-scripting a programming language implementation by using the object language as a meta language. And I think it's a really powerful idea. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a great way to, for language users to gain some control over their implementations that, that, they, that they use otherwise as black boxes. So uh, uh, you can learn more about Meta FSTAR uh, from the uh, FSTAR website or from Project Everest. And I'll be happy to take questions. I think it's, it's uh, deciding, that's several questions in there actually, so uh, 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 deciding when to use a tactic as opposed to uh, SMT um, out of the box is, I think it's something that you, that you, um, you learn by bitter experience, honestly. You try SMT first and it, it fails, or it works sometimes, you change the program slightly, it doesn't work anymore. And then, um, uh, and then you say, okay, I'm, I'm going, I know exactly how this proof is supposed to work. Uh, you know, I, I know I'm working with this DSL or this theory, uh, and you, you, write it, you, you consider writing a tactic for it. Now, in terms of making sure that your tactics are robust and successfully are able to handle um, a broad class of proofs rather than just the one particular program that you're after, I think this is really kind of two uses of tactics that uh, I've um, uh, seen people who who are much more experienced than me with tactics. I mean, George Gontier, for instance, uh, distinguishes uh, proof scripting from proof programming. And proof scripting is this kind of activity where you're in video game mode, 
and you're just banging out this one particular proof, this one particular uh, uh, goal that you're trying to solve. And it's a perfectly legitimate use of, of, of this kind of system. Proof programming is something you know that's I think kind of a, a, an art form that you know you have to see if it, well is there some decision procedure or partial decision procedure that, that captures a large class of goals, and um, they may not always be one, um, and um, I don't have the generic advice, that you know, I think it's a, it's, you have to, it's, you have to consider it carefully. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, can you uh, just explain or capture the difference between your ideas and what NSAC might do for COC, uh, and the sort of monadic <coughs> interpretations they take about sort of the yeah, I think uh, I think MTAC is also very much in this uh, in this class uh, of, uh, uh, of of typed tactic languages like uh, like Idris and Dean and, and MSTAR and so on. I think the the, uh, the difference that I see there is that MTAC is trying to uh, deeply embed aspects of COC into COC. Um, for instance, the typing environment is presented to an MTAC programmer as a big telescope of sigma terms. Which then raises the, prob the, the problem of you're trying to internalize type theory inside type theory for, um, um, well, this is my bias, for questionable purposes. You're only trying to write a meta program. You're not trying to prove anything, you're not trying to prove your tactic program correct for all, uh, 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 that is going to correctly solve all goals. So the, the cost of embedding type theory into type theory is something that we avoid by saying, you're just in an effect that is operating over an internal compiler data structure that's an abstract type. We're not trying to encode the proof state as a big sigma. Okay. Um, how do you ensure the type safety of meta programs? So meta programs are, they're just F-star programs. And F-star programs are, um, they are, they are type safe to the extent that a program to a particular, with a, a meta program with a particular signature can either diverge uh, or uh, raise exceptions uh, uh, and uh, mutate proof states from proof states to proof states. And that's, from the type signature, that's what you get. Now, you can also, meta programs are, are, are augmented with, uh, you can augment them with, with specifications because every effect in F star can have a weakest precondition associated with it. And so you can prove things like, you know, my meta program is never going to take the head of an empty list. So you don't need something like in like a Okama or some like a model type theory to, for the safety of, of meta programs? No, meta programs are isolated from programs by the effect system, and meta programs are type safe to the extent that all F star programs are type safe. So I'm wondering, how does the debugging work? So normally when I'm in a purely SMT-based setting, I look at counterexamples typically. If I'm in a purely cock based setting, I look at the open proof code and try to understand how to continue. Yeah. So how, what kind of feedback do I get from this combination of tactics and SMT? Both those things. And, and if you, so the way it, it, it works is that you, you write a tactic, and you can, um, as you write a tactic, you get a trace of, um, of proof states. And you can inspect the, the goal like you would in COC, the goal and the effect of the tactic on the goal. Um, and then uh, when you feed a, a, a query out to SMT, uh, it goes through FSR's default SMT encoding, and the SMT runs on that particular goal. And um, uh, that you get FSR's usual error reporting, which can always be better. And you can ask SM, the SMT solver, solver for counterexamples. Uh, to be honest, we don't do that much with counterexamples. We should do more. Any more questions? can be any F star program. They may be just uh, proof terms, or they may be, in this case, if at the end of this, as this, this program runs, this hold is really filled by lambda a, lambda x, dot x. 
and you can extract it and run it like a normal identity program. Uh, but it doesn't have to be just your programs. You can extract a, a stateful program doing parsing and uh, serializing and extract it to C. Any of our program can be meta programs. Meta programs can be meta programs. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's take the rest of the discussion offline and uh, thank you again.